computer. All right, good afternoon. I am Mark Shapiro, music director and conductor of Cantori, New York. With me are two distinguished guests, composer Tariq O'Regan, and shall we call you a philosophy professor, philosopher? What do we call you? You can call me philosophy professor. Philosophy professor, Amy Baer. Uh, so the occasion for this um, gathering is that the Chamber Chorus Cantori New York is going to perform a composition by Tariq O'Regan called A Letter of Rights in November in New York City, um, whose text is by Alice Goodman and deals with things that touch on the professional areas of interest of Dr. Bear. So with um, no further ado, we'll do a couple of preliminaries. So let's have each of you tell us sort of where you are and what the connection is. We'll start with you, Tariq. Uh, where are you? I'm here in San Francisco, sunny San Francisco. And is it sunny today? It's, it's very sunny, yes. Yeah, it's, um, it's our late summer that you get here in uh, sort of September, October. Um, it. So it's always pleasant at this time of year. Now, am I correct that you were born in Ireland? I was born in London. In London? Um, uh, yeah. Predominantly grew up in the UK, but also in North Africa, where my mother's family is from. Um, but certainly, if you go back two generations, my father, my on my father's side, they would have considered themselves Irish. Um, I see. And I moved to the United States in two thousand and three, so I've lived in, and I'm now a dual dual citizen American um, and British. Right. Uh, for about okay, yes. five, six years. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, and just as a composer, I know you've had uh, quite a bit of success in a lot of areas. I know you've written um, a great deal of choral music, also opera, right? Yeah, opera. Uh, recently, uh, it, the basic career trajectory started off really doing a lot of choral work, um, partly from studying in Oxford and their sort of natural and then doing my grad work in Cambridge, and there's a natural tendency towards that because of the number of choirs in, in these two relatively small um, places. And then um, from that, expanding into instrumental music, uh, orchestral work, and then from there into works for stage. So uh, recent sort of big, big stage projects have been um, the Dutch National Ballet, uh, Houston Grand Opera. Uh, and right now I work with uh, Philharmonia Baroque Orchestra here in San Francisco uh, as their composer in residence. Um, and the exciting thing about that actually is sort of not only writing for them, but beginning to shepherd uh, a new commissioning uh, program for them. So we get lots of new work for the, the, the wonderful uh, musicians that they are. This sounds so, yeah. great. Yeah, you're a very busy person. Um, and Dr. Baer? Tell us a bit about, uh, first of all, since you are a member of Cantori New York, perhaps you can also mention that and your professional um, context. Yeah, so I'm a professor of philosophy at Hofstra University, and I've been here since 2003. Um, I'm actually a, consider myself a political philosopher. Um, uh, uh, at Hofstra, I teach Courses primarily in philosophy of law, uh, even though I'm in my, you know, my my writing tends to be in political philosophy. And um, I've been uh, singing with Cantori since 1995, off and on. Took some uh, breaks for family reasons. Um, and um, I'm a big fan of uh, Mark Shapiro's, um, and especially. Um, it's especially such a delight to have Mark uh, kind of navigate our way through new music. Um, it's always just really thrilling uh, when Mark uh, will show up at rehearsal and say he's discovered a new uh, a new score and he wants to share it with us. And um, it's always just, you know, very exciting. And I think also 
um, intellectually uh, challenging. It's I would like to say that um, singing with Cantori is a full body experience. You know, it's about it's about the body, <laughs> it's about the heart and the spirit, but it's also always about the brain. And I think that the the text uh, of um, a letter of rights is um, is um, uh, you know particularly it's particularly the case with that with that text. And um, so I spent a little time, you know, really thinking about the the text. Um, uh, I have little. I have no training in musicology, so you know my my interest in this in this work really revolves around around the text by Alice Goodman, which I think is very intriguing. So just before we get into the nitty gritty, um, Tari, could you tell us about the genesis of the piece, how it came to exist? Yeah, sure. It was, um, you know, it came about. I mean, the first thing I should say is, one, I'm absolutely you know delighted that you're doing the work. Um, uh, it's been done in various places, and it, I think it, it holds a, a special place in my heart as a work. So the fact that Cantor in New York is doing it is, is um, really honoured. Um, the other thing that I should preface and say, you know, this work with Alice is very much a collaboration of, of equal parts, and it's um, both in the genesis of it and the creation of the work, and it's you know, there's a tendency with operas, for example, for it to be, you know, a compo historically to be a composer's project um, with, you know, a librettist and a slightly smaller font. Um, and that, you know, I just want to sort of say straight off the bat, it's absolutely, you know, not the case here. I mean, I think we came into it as equal creative and intellectual um, partners. And so um, relatively rare for a, for a project in, in that regard, this actually came about um, predominantly through um, Alice, um, who was approached by uh, Salisbury um, uh, Cathedral, um, which is where uh, one of the uh, um, extant sources of Magna Carta survives. Um, I think there's two in the British Library, one there and one in Lincoln castle of of the of the many that were um uh sort of copied when the original document came out and so as one of the four holders of these original series of of of, of magna cartas which you know if you've ever seen it it's not very big uh pretty small pretty densely written not particularly frankly not particularly ex <laughs> exciting to look at visually um they were keen to, to mark the 800th anniversary of, of the, the creation of the document in 1215. So this is um, uh, 2015. And um, basically Alice and I, who'd got to know each other at Trinity College, Cambridge, where I at that point was a fellow there, um, which is what they call the sort of academic staff. And Alice was a chaplain uh, at, at Trinity at the same time um, we got we got we became friends and got to talking and obviously I I known her work uh, for uh, the, the opera she'd worked on with John Adams death of Klinghoffer and Nixon in China so I you know very much aware of her work and when she when she you know basically said look this may maybe maybe there's something here you know should we do something together I sort of said yes, I jumped at the chance and uh, went down to uh, Salisbury, met up with it, went up, went up with everyone there and, and um, uh, really just began thinking about what is it that we want to do? Because it's one of those curious things where the word Magna Carta is certainly recognized and its general understanding as some kind of important legal philosophical document is in, is understood but precisely what is is very misunderstood and and curiously i would say it's kind of perhaps has a greater relevancy uh in terms of you know public perception of an enshrining of rights in in the usa where that where there is a bill of rights um than it does in the uk where we don't we don't have that type of fixed document um and it's interesting that alice was you know an uh, uh, is an american who's naturalized as a brit 
and I'm a Brit who's naturalized as an American. So coming at it with these sort of dualities and a shared understanding of how it means slightly different things, certainly just emotionally, colloquially, um, really helped us um, begin thinking about the piece. And it was, it was Alice who came up with the idea of it really being about sacrifice and about poise. And this came about because my basic understanding in the UK is, you know, the majority of the clauses have been repealed over the years as, as our legislation shifts. Um, but there is that one, um, one clause that remains um, in our statutes in the UK, that the no free man shall be taken or imprisoned, blah, blah, blah. Um, and so we, we really wanted to, to narrow it down to that and then think about poise. And so really the idea became about two things, linguistic poise, which is the way in which those words were fought over. Oh, we've lost Tariq for a minute. Are you with us, Dr. Bear? I'm here. Uh oh. Oh dear. We lost, we lost the West Coast. Yes. yes. Um, okay. Yeah, we lost you for a bit there, Tariq, unfortunately. Oh, sorry. Where where do we get up to? Uh, let's see. We got up to the. Uh, you were just talking about poise. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, sorry, you wouldn't believe I'm in the, the, the tech heart of America. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, having said that, let me bring Dr. Bear into the conversation here. Can I call you Amy, Amy? Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> um, so you have a lot of thoughts I know about the, um, and I think it's particularly interesting, your, your role, dual role as a scholar and performer of this piece, because you've sung it through now completely. Mm -hmm. um, what your thoughts are about what Tariq has said so far about the, the role of the Magna Carta in our world mm -hmm. through history and now, and yeah, well, how, you, how you feel this piece expresses those thoughts. Yeah, well, I, I was really struck by the claim that texts are acts, uh, which appears uh, early on uh, and then uh, appears later. Are you still with us, Tariq? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, right. I'm so just going to say it one more time so it's really clear. The phrase is texts are acts. Yes, texts are acts. And um, so I was very, very uh, curious about, about that. And um, that got me to looking more closely at the text itself, um, at the text of the Magna Carta. I actually listened to it on YouTube. It read, it listened to it, read to me on YouTube. That was pretty interesting. Um, and so there's this, there's this sense in which um, the piece um, describes the actual act of making a text. So, um, right. So the creation of the parchment out of sheepskin, not out of lambskin, um, suggesting to me uh, that this is a secular ritual, not a religious one. Um, uh, but that, um, and also that the, you know, a discussion of the, or a description of the uh, creation of the ink. Um, and I did actually a little poking around about um, what oak galls are. Y'all know what uh, oak galls are. So apparently they are, or oak apple, uh, they are a little encapsulation that the oak tree creates when a wasp lays its larva uh, in the bark. Um, so just th th this, and then, you know, that ink would be created out of this uh, miraculous little, little, uh, little growth on an oak tree, right? That, that, so texts are acts. Is a, is suggests, I think, that, um, that they have to be made and they have to be made actually physically. Um, and that um, one, one important um, way to appreciate the Magna Carta is to recognize its actual physical genesis. Um, and so that, you know, that was sort of my first thought about yeah. you know, 
text, text being acts. Um, and you really, you really get the sense of that, I think, in the third part, uh, when you're describing this, you know, the, the work of the parchmenters, you know, that the, what they're doing requires skill, you know, um, uh, and that they couldn't, they, you know, you can mess up. Um, uh, um, there's nothing um, kind of given about the fact that this document would arise and that these rights would be asserted and so on. And that the, the, the Latin text of uh, clauses 39 and 40 is sung or, um, over uh, a description of the material um, processes of uh, producing the actual text, uh, um, you know, understood as a piece of parchment with ink on it. I thought that was pretty interesting and maybe you have some thoughts about that. Yeah, that I mean, that really is at the heart of the work. And th this thing about poise is, yeah, very much physically. So, yes, one mistake and you've ruined it. And but at the same time, this sense of, you know, the of the further, you know, uh, section five, several more days to work out the precise wording we come back to nature of precision. So here we're talking about legalistic and linguistic precision as overlaid to physical precision, but crafts making precision. And this is very important because it comes back to the idea of text being acts, as you say. And the phrase that came to my mind when writing the piece was the idea of making a mark. And whether we're talking about a single mark with a pen or with, 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 with the ability to write a parchment or ink, or whatever it is, the, the making a mark, an incision, or we, whether we're making a mark on society, or a, a legalistic mark, a philosophical mark, and that, that sense of sort of the gesture being one from nothing to the gesture and back is, re, re, is, what, is why the piece is palindromic in that sense. There's a physicality to that coming and going that was very important to me um, when I when I wrote the, the work. And also a, it, this sense of a sort of slightly ritualistic feel to the piece is that echoes for me the ritualistic nature of making the the parchment, which you're right, it's a it's a secular thing, but it begins that you cannot make parchment without killing something. You know, so we we start with the killing of an animal. An animal has died. Blood has been shed. Before anything, we start with this. And so that is a very ritualistic, in my mind, sense. The death of anything for, for, this, for, a, for this very specific reason is an intentional death. Mm. And to, to have that recognized very firmly in the beginning of the work um, is, was, became important to me as I began, um, you know, working on the music, and I think it was it was important to Alice because the way that the, the text evolved actually was a sort of a slow whittling down of of lots and lots of material. This probably represents one tenth of when the material that was created and put together and collated from different sources, and also written and poetry that she created. So we also went through this process of. Um, working out the precise wording. Mm. Yeah, I mean, there, I think this, this idea that texts are acts, you know, it got me thinking about um, the activity uh, more generally, um, not only of making the parchment and the ink and so on, um, but, um, you know, but what is involved actually in uh, the realization of the rights that are asserted in the Magna Carta. And um, it's very interesting in um, part four, I don't know whether this was intentional. Uh, I'm guessing that it, that it was. Um, I, I think um, Alice Goodman is pointing to a Kafka story uh, called Before the Law that uh, involves, yeah, that involves a, um, uh, a man who is um, sort of glimpses, uh, the glimpses justice through a door, uh, but um, there's a doorkeeper who won't, who won't let him in. And he, he continually asks, will you let me in? Will you let me in? And the doorkeeper says, uh, well, I'm not the only doorkeeper. There are lots of doorkeepers behind me and so on, but he doesn't even get past the, the first doorkeeper. And then, um, you know, ultimately uh, he dies of old age before he, before justice, uh, he has access to justice. And so I think, you know, I got thinking a little bit about, you know, the sacrifice of the sheep to make the parchment is described as the initial sacrifice, you know, so what are the other sacrifices that are necessary or what are the other costs involved 
in realizing the rights promised um, you know, by the rule of law and so on. And um, so one of them obviously is a kind of institutional structure that makes good on our claims to justice. Um, and this, this idea that the, the, the poem suggests that, um, that our rights are not, so the rights are not just sort of granted as noblesse ob oblige, or they, they could be, they could be, right? They could be then taken away. So we, we have to demand them, right? We have to, we have to invoke them. Uh, yes. and, and when we, in, after we invoke them, then there has to be an echo. You know, the, the institutional structure has to be there to respond to our claim. Uh, to our claims to justice. Um, and so, you know, among the sacrifices or the costs of justice are that we, we need to be vigilant. We have to create institutions that actually respond to the, to the you know, the invocation of our rights. And then also, I think, um, you know, the possibility of further bloodshed is invoked at the end of part six. Um, the idea being there that to make good on our rights um, might even require the spilling of blood. Yeah, I yeah, I think I absolutely agree with you, and I, I think that's such an interesting sort of development of this idea of there are the rights and the enactment of the rights, and that that they are both separate and entwined. And um, there's a sort of glimpse of that with our interest in you know I think what in what in, what in America in the United States is called the Miranda warning, which is. It's not only that the, your rights are read to you, but, uh, you know, and it may even, you know, historically, I'm sure it's changed over time, but this idea of, do you understand each of these rights? Do you, you know, these are your rights, but do you understand them? Do you, are you aware that there are the rights and there are the enactment of the rights? So this sort of crucial, which you know, you're right, isn't it? A fundamentally institutional um, insurance, I suppose, um, was very much, you know, yeah, it's very much in the in the piece, and I think, you know, I think we we it was quite it was it was very interesting writing it in that regard because we each had sort of it was one of those things where you can just keep getting deeper and deeper and deeper into little alleys of 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 where this document ends up in one's life, um, and uh, for example, at some point I remember. I'm probably not sure if I can get the story right, but I remember wondering about the word Miranda in the Miranda warning and looking up the name of the person that it's named after. It's this sort of terribly tragic story that, you know, the person that ended up, you know, being part of the, the civil suit or the, the litigation that creates the Miranda warning. You know, I think let, this guy led a pretty, pretty bad life, you know, pretty sad life. And it, at one point ends up with, you know, postcards of the Miranda warning, which he keeps on him as a sort of, um, this is who I am. <laughs> you know? um, uh, uh, sense of identity there, that it's sort of, his, his whole life has now been wrapped up in this sort of uh, piece of legalese that, that, that he keeps on him. And so this sort of, these strange little ways and byways that one would end up thinking about the piece and how it connects large scale forms of democratic protection right down to sort of the individual and where it where it and where it doesn't you know um how things have you know certainly um changed um in you know the way in which I, su I suppose the, all the old films in England that we all know, you know, you have a right to remain silent, you know, any, any, any you know, except that in the UK, certainly remaining silent now does have an implication of guilt, which it did, which it never did. Um, and so that, you know, these, these slight, which again is a difference to, you know, one in, in, in the US, one proudly asserts the Fifth Amendment right. Um, while in the UK, one doesn't do, one doesn't yeah. do that. Yeah. And so, the, you know, these, 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 
going back to the fact of like where we've ended up in our lives, Alice and me, where we've come from, and thinking about these sort of subtle differences that come from the same document feels very interesting. It feels very related to this idea of something very simply written down, a right enshrined in a clause, what's left of you know, the Magna Carta, let's say we're talking about these two clauses, and how it manifests itself institutionally, how it manifests itself in national boundaries, how it manifests itself legislatively around the world, is, is very different, you know? Yeah. And so I think, going back to your point about the rights and the maintenance of the rights, is where it begins to diverge um, between the page and the acts as they are mm. protected or not protected. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Now, I, and now I'm torn. I want to ask you uh, uh, two things. But one, one is about silence. So the word silence appears twice. Uh, the, the first time it appears, it's that the people are silent um, uh, in the face of the king's power. Um, yeah. And then later, the silence is something to which someone has a right. And I was thinking that the two appearances of the word silence couldn't have been an accident. I think that I think they're not an accident. <laughs> <laughs> Let's say they're not an accident. <laughs> <laughs> Let's say that. Let's I mean, all agree. The, right. Where, I is mean, the, where is the first silence? And I can. Uh, the first silence is in the, the end of, in the middle of the second uh, part, the land kept silence. Yes. Um, and then it, you know, then it comes back again in the form of having the right to remain silent. I mean, I thought that that was a, an, an interesting, um, an in, uh, so two d interesting ways in which silence is important. On the one hand, the people are, you know, being silenced, right? Or that silence is an involuntary situation for the people. And then uh, later, silence is something that is chosen. It's something to yes, which someone I, has a right. Yes. And I think it's, I mean, Looking at it, I think it's the it's the 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 time that you by the time we get towards silence as an act, you have a right to remain silent. In the piece, we've gone, we, you know, we get we've it, if you if if the piece were dramatized, then you know the the we've we've reached the point to which the Magna Carta has been written and these these rights have been enshrined. So. By that point, the silence has moved from a, from a position of passivity to an, an active role. And it comes back to this idea of it being an act. Silence can be an act, a, a, an active thing that one can do. It's not a negative space yes. um, at that point in part six or seven or where, where it comes later on in the work. Yeah. Um, but, and and it, 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 it shifts. Um, from yeah, I mean, I, gra I think graphic designers talk of negative space. So it shifts from being, you know, ne a, a negative space to a positive space. Um, and uh, that again, you know, that is probably not a coincidence that I'm thinking of it in terms of typography and graphic design. Because again, we're, we're, we're talking about the written word. We're talking about writing and text. Um, and uh, yeah, that's the journey that the that happens certainly. Um, yeah. But, um, and there are a lot, I mean, there are so many things that you sort of, that I can, you know, you end up looking in works and you sort, you almost feel like they've been subconsciously, you've been thinking about these things. Um, but I mean, yeah, if, if at some point you get a chance to speak with Alice, I'm sure she'd um, uh, Great idea. Give, you, no. give you so much like, yeah. um, uh, Really, I mean, she, she's just one of the smartest people I know, and I, you know, just the the thought, the conversations we had around this were so um, interesting, and I think a very, you know, really um, echoed in your like these are really you know on topic and great questions. Mm. <laughs> you know, I, me I, very much of working working on it. I just I, I I would be remiss if I did not mention that the that the rights articulated at the time that the Magna Carta was written were really only for um, um, the aristocracy, um, yeah. for, the, for, the, for the, the barons, the lords, the knights, and yeah. so on. Women were explicitly excluded from them. Um, 
and uh, the, you know lower peasants were not. And for 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 women at the time in the lower peasants, they really continued to be subject to the arbitrary will either of you know yeah. male relatives or um, uh, or the lords you know whose whose land they they were stuck living on. And so this were you know uh, it, seriously it was the beginning of a of a of a long project um, that you know we're still in a sense in a sense uh, working through. So uh, yeah, and, and, and in, in British legislation, you get a feeling of that because, you know, I can't remember how many clauses there are, but, you know, they've all been repealed one by one mm -hmm. over the years as they, they no longer, they didn't really offer the protection that they claimed to, to protect, or they were superseded mm -hmm. by actually greater protections for yeah. uh, non-aristocrats, non-nobles, women. And so all we are left with are... are these couple of clauses from this very important document, um, which I find again, you know, and and yes, they hold a legal place in British legislation. I suspect they also hold an emotional place. Speaking to your point, as it being the beginning of something, mm -hmm. <laughs> rather than anything specifically defining, um, uh, uh, it, it, certainly from a UK perspective. Um, yeah. But in, in a way, it's the nearest thing that we have to some early version of, of a Bill of Rights. This, I, I mean, some, some sense of a document containing some form of protection. But yeah, majority I, of it, I, yeah. Can, can, I ask, can I ask one final question? I know Mark's trying to get in here, but I wanna make sure this question oh. gets asked. So if texts are acts, and your score is a text of a kind, what what is it doing? What kind of an act is it? Well, I so I I really view one one of the jokes we had was that we were we well the joke we had when we were writing it was that we would not be writing a magna cantata. <laughs> that was <laughs> so we didn't want to write this thing that was a sort of like a statement. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, really, in terms of, and I think what when you talk about Magna Carta being the beginning of something, I, I honestly think where we have ended up with in this piece is is really the beginning of the types of conversation that we are ha having here. And so the act that I would say we try to do with a, with a letter of rights is it it is an opening letter and the beginning of a correspondence in the way that letters are. And really I hope it creates conversations and I hope it creates different thoughts in people performing it, hearing the work, maybe in subsequent pieces, either by me or by others, but it is a beginning. And it is that, it is the act of an opening letter um, in, in what I hope to be some kind of, you know, correspondence that, that, that continues. And certainly Alice and I have, you know, have continued over the years, coming back to it and chatting about it, um, and it's been done. You know, it's been done in a variety of places, each with each, each with their own take on it. But it, what what it isn't, I would say, is is a very distinct statement. It's not. We're not saying this is what you should think. Mm -hmm. Really, it's a sort of way into the complexities um, that you've you know brought out here in this conversation, and that you, we, you know you can keep talking and keep thinking about it because it's. It's for something that has an image, and this is, comes back to where we begin, but something that has an image in one's mind, Magna Carta, this thing, it's so clear. It's, it's this great fixed thing that's going to save us all. That it's so messy. You know, it's so messy. It's so not clear. And it's so complicated. And it's, I think that's really where, where we are, which is, you know, embrace the nuance in, in the peace and in life. So I'll just jump in with one quick thing. We do need to wrap up. It's, uh, I feel like this could go on and on. It's so interesting. Um, but I, I want to just mention, as speaking sort of from the hearer of the music, which Amy also is, that I think what you're describing about its Promethean quality of it's the beginning, I really hear that in the sound of the piece itself that Tariq, you made, that it really has this, you know, it's always amazing to me how composers achieve the effects that they achieve. That's the talent, I think, and the inspiration. Um, but I think we do hear, as we listen to the sound of this piece um, on these words, this Promethean excitement of something 
begun, a work begun, which I think is something that both of you are saying, um, a work that is requires a certain poise, a situation of poise, and then I think I'm projecting my own anxieties onto a certain fragility, yes. um, precariousness. And I think all of that is in the sound of the piece itself. The piece has a tremendous optimism, I think, in its sound, but there is also something, it is not without shadow um, and a kind of ominous something <laughs> in the undertow. Um, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. it's it's really a wonderful piece. I think it fits beautifully on this program. I, I spoke with um, our other living featured composer, Derek Sky, this morning. Oh, yeah. Also, exactly. Yes. Very interested in this idea of of the balance that we live with as people in the world. Um, so I want to thank you both so very much for for participating in this. Thank um, you. Eric, we look forward to meeting you one day. And Amy, I'll see you at rehearsal. Yes. <laughs> um, I'll just stop the recording and thank you uh, one more time.